So, um, what is the main source of, of, of coupling? And why do we run into this situation? If I, if I, if I look back at my own youth, or youth, not, not my youth, I didn't learn to program in my youth, but uh, early on in the career, I tried to figure out how to write software. And one of the things you learned, and you probably all learned this, is this golden rule, like you need to increase cohesion and decrease coupling, right? I'm pretty sure you all had that, heard that before. So how do you increase, um, so how do you decrease coupling, typically? Abstractions. Abstractions, yes, thank you. Abstractions. Um, which is great. So we introduce interfaces, uh, we, read the, we read the design patterns book, we start to use applying all these patterns uh, because it's awesome, you can check it off. Uh, did I do a visitor pattern this year? I should check it off because uh, you know, I can put it on my resume. Um, you probably read all the other books by Uncle Bob, for example, he wrote a, really, a, a lot of great books. Um, but then you start to have a problem that you have too many abstractions. And maybe you've seen the meme, like there's no prob there's no no there's no problem you cannot solve except of the problem of too many abstractions. Maybe you've seen that in the past. Um, so abstractions is in principle not a bad thing. There's no bad thing in our profession. Every concept, every tool, every principle has pros and cons. That is just a fact. So uh, uh, and then cohesion. Cohesion is by is all about trying to bring the things together which belong together. So to make sure that every concept, every, let's say, business rule or business entity or big capability is in one place of the code base. So how do you make sure that everything is in one place and one place only and everybody else uses that? I'm going to be engaging. I have to do it without the presentation. So you guys and girls have to... Uh, what, do, what, is the, what is the rule? What do you learn when you start developing? You don't want to fix the bug twice. So what do you do? Refactoring. What is the rule behind that? When the sun is very hot and there's no rain, what is it? <laughs> Dry. Don't repeat yourself. That is the thing here, actually. Oh, you probably said that, but I couldn't hear that. Don't repeat yourself. The problem with dry, and again, it's a good principle, that it leads to too much coupling. Because what happens, we introduce these generic pieces of code, like an infrastructure project or a common project or something like that, or helpers or whatever, where you put all the generic code in there. That is a problem, because that's create, that creates coupling. Even though everybody says dry is a good thing, don't repeat yourself. Coupling is something you don't want. So how do you solve that? It is about understanding the internal boundaries of your system. That is really important. Internal boundaries, like what does that mean? Uh, okay, let me, do I actually have paper? Do I have this? I'll bring it a bit forward. So you can all see it, so. You call this improvising, yes, it is improvisation. I didn't expect it to be able to do this today, but let's try to do it. So, um, Decoupling. If you look at a system, and you look at, if you look back at your own system, the code base you're looking at right now, do you actually understand what are the internal seams of the system? Do you understand the layers, the, all the aspects of the system? Do you understand like um, what components exist in that code base and what should be reusable? Do you, do you, does anybody have, a, you don't have to answer, it's just like who actually has a good understanding of their system? Okay, just, just a couple of people. The rest doesn't care or it's just, uh, you know. One of the best way to decouple is to apply, for example, the dependency inversion principle. So that's the D in domain-driven design. How does that work? Um, let's say I have a, a domain component or something. And typically that domain component needs to be able to talk to, um, needs to talk to some abstraction. To, for example, to be able to interact with the database. So typically we have something like, I don't know, is anybody, anybody from the .NET space? I'm from the .NET space, by the way. Oh, I forgot something. So my name is Dennis. <laughs> I'm an alcoholic, no. Um, and this is the group of people that don't use presentations. Um, I work for a small company in the Netherlands. Uh, I have about 26 years of experience. I call myself continuous improver because as you can imagine, I try to continuously improve myself. I care about architecture tools, uh, but also about people, which is the most difficult part of uh, my job, 
in general. I guess it's the same for all of you. Um, I'm in the .NET space. Um, I have a blog, which I cannot share. You can find me on LinkedIn if you want to. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Mastodon and even on Blue Sky. That's apparently the new thing. I have one follower, so it's not really make a difference. Uh, people from .NET space, you may have heard of something like Fluent Assertions, a small library. I created that. Pretty proud. has 250 million downloads on Nuket. Uh, probably that's why I'm here, because they think that I actually know what I'm talking about. I don't. Um, enough about me. Uh, but, oh, by the way, oh, you know what? I'll just do a bit of this. This is my Twitter handler, in case you want to reach out to me, because I will share the slides afterwards. Hopefully, the slides actually align with my story right now, because I'm trying to remember what I actually put on my slides. So, in a... Do Sorry? Can you spell it because oh, it's -E M-E-N. M from Maria, the E from Eduard, and the N from Nikita. Trying to think of a name in this region. So typically what happens, we have something like, uh, I don't know, I customer, customer repository. You know, these generic repository interfaces, that's what we do, right? So this thing depends on that. Now what happens, this is an interface or an abstraction. In .NET we prefix everything with the I. Um, then we have something called the repository. Repository, you don't have to be able to read that because I can't read it either. Or let's call it the data access layer. This is typically what you do. You have this lower level abstraction, you know, which interacts with the database. Let's draw a database here, blah, 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 blah. Beautiful database. This looks very big, it's probably Oracle. Um, now the question is, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this is that this is a lower level abstraction. This is something that lives in the bowels of the system, typically. It depends on the database. So what's the problem with things that live very low in the system? They're very generic, right? What's the problem with generic code? Anybody willing to answer that? Generic code tends to become even more generic. You know, it's always with good intentions that we put something in some kind of supporting library, like a data access layer. The thing is, they become more generic. You know, now you have one user, maybe there's a couple of other domain layers that also try, can we maybe shut that down so to not create confusion, because you should be looking at me and not to the presentation there. Um, you have a couple of more modules, and they all need similar things. They all need to be able to interact with customers. So they all start to depend on this abstraction. The thing is, those, the, 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 the way they consume that abstraction is going to change over time. It's going to diverge a little bit. And that's usually what happens. Abstractions, all the generic code always starts with a good reusable piece of code. But then different parts of the system need different things. And what do we do? We create another method. We create another parameter. We create multiple levels of abstractions, like uh, subclasses, you know, in between, and it becomes more complicated. That is the biggest problem with, with uh, uh, coupling and uh, applying dry, because this thing becomes so big and so difficult that you, you have no clue what it's doing. And even if you can read the code, because you obviously all write beautiful code, you know, you all read the clean code book, you do test-driven development, no, you don't, uh, but you write unit tests, probably not. Um, uh, the thing is, it becomes too complicated. So, what the dependency inversion principle is saying is, we actually do not want higher level abstractions, that's the official term, to depend on lower level abstractions. So, you don't want things like the domain to depend on generic code here. So, what do you do? Well, you actually do this. You make sure that this abstraction is owned by the domain. And then you let the dependency go like this. Like, huh? But that's what you're doing all the time, right? This interface, this, this class implements this interface. That's exactly what it's doing. The subtle difference is this abstraction is owned and defined by this class. That is the big difference here. Also, and that's another advantage, this interface is generic, right? You're going to have all kinds of generic methods. This thing will evolve and become more, you know, as I said, that there will be multiple methods, lots of different parameters. So at the end, if you are the implementer of this layer, you know databases have limitations, right? If you're on the SQL Server side, you have to think about clustered and non-clustered indexes. You cannot add unlimited uh, views to your database. It's not going to work. So you want to optimize. But in this layer, 
you probably don't even know how to optimize because these methods will be very generic. However, if this domain defines this abstraction, it can define, it can specify exactly what it wants. It wants, for example, the high-valued client. And it can define that, what it means. And then this implementation can maybe even create a separate view, separate index, maybe even use a completely different database structure, like a NoSQL solution or event sourcing. And Greg, uh, Greg Young is going to be talking about this at five, hopefully with the slides. Um, so you're basically referring, and the fact is, if there's another module, let's say call this domain two, this one will also define its own customer repository. And this one will also implement that. That is the crux here. That's really the, the, the subtle difference. Now, what I'm saying is that if you apply this principle on the architecture level, there's, there's ways to do that. Um, one of the ways to do that, in the meantime, uh, my friend here is trying to make everything work, but I don't have trust it will be solved. Um, there are architecture styles that actually embrace this whole idea. For example, it would be very funny if there's a really indecent picture here beneath or something, like somebody was a joke. Um, maybe you've heard of this architecture. What is that? Sorry? Onion. onion. Great. True. So usually onion architecture has something like the domain in the middle, and then they call it, I think, uh, business uh, processes or something. Business processes. And then they have the UI on the outer ring. They have the database or the database abstraction there. They have APIs and probably lots of other stuff. It's different. That's just an example. So if you apply the same principle, basically what happens, your dependencies will go inward. So your domain, your entities, will not directly interact with the database. They will define an abstraction that the outer layer can implement. There's also another version of that, which I can try to draw, is like this. Um, like this. Something like that, a socket drawing. And it also has a domain in the middle and then it has adapters here and they call it, I think, uh, primary and secondary gateways or something like that. Um, anybody knows what it is? Sorry? Hexagon. It's a great picture that you can actually deduct it from this. The same principle, dependencies go inwards. So the more complicated things, the things that we talked about, the things that are really uh, let's say, um, difficult to, to handle, databases, abstractions, UI, are all on the outskirts of the system. So it's the database code that depends on the domain layer, not the other way around. By the way, there's another version of this, which is called clean architecture, which I think is more or less uh, Uncle Bob, Robert C. Martin's own implementation of that, but it's the same principle. Okay. Now, what I usually do, and I'm just liberally taking all these pages, pages. I try to organize my code like that. Functional slices, capabilities, I used to call them. Capabilities. They have a bit of UI in it, they have a little bit of database in it, they have business logic, business BL, business logic, and sometimes there's some kind of gluing code and maybe some shared services. Now, let's call this composition. Composition, and I call this shared services. That's kind of my um, reference architecture. I'm not really good at writing because I don't do that that often. It's so, uh, so analog this, huh? this whole thing. This is the impl unplugged version of my presentation. So why is this relevant? Because I like to think that each of those slices has its own architecture. So when I said like onion architecture or, or something like uh, event sourcing and CQRS, that is a local concern. I treat it as such. So for me, these are boundaries. These are internal boundaries. It also means that there's no direct dependencies between them. If this, this slide needs something, it would define a little contract here, an interface or something like that, just as I just explained. And that interface will define what it needs. Maybe this one also has an interface to define what it needs. It needs storage or something, or it needs some, some shared capability. It may also define what it provides, and this one will also expose what it provides. The idea is then that the composition layer actually connects everything together. That's the idea. Why is that nice? Because you could think like that's very puristic and very extreme level of abstraction. Because it allows you to have this whole thing and treat it as a kind of unit. 
maybe you have heard of the term unit testing. I actually like to try to see this as a unit. It's independent. It may have APIs here. It may have a storage layer. Um, and I treat that as an internal boundary. And why is that important? Because I apply dry, don't repeat yourself, within boundaries. That's another reason to make sure that you don't create too much coupling. So let's say I have a surface, like in .NET, it's very popular to create extension methods for everything. Extensions for collections, for strings, or whatever. Uh, but maybe there's something similar, like, um, I don't know, uh, some code to um, calculate the, uh, the number of items in a collection based on a predicate, on some kind of thing. That's very generic. In, 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 like if, if in traditional world, you'll probably introduce a generic project and everybody, everybody depends on that. There you have it, coupling. So what I do, I just duplicate it here. I have a similar implementation here. I have a similar implementation here. I have another one here. And maybe I have also another one here. That's totally fine. So I'm forcefully, I'm, I really push myself to not actually try to deduplicate things because it creates coupling. Except there might be things which are so complicated, so, so important, or so crucial that you definitely don't want to duplicate that. Then I put them in something like a shared services thing. Make sense? And it's weird because a lot of people will think, yeah, but you're duplicating code. You know, we have SonarCube. And what does SonarCube? They say, yeah, you have too many duplications. Uh, it's being recorded. I was going to sh swear. Um, that is nonsense. Uh, because that's the first thing I disable. I don't care. I actually like duplication to a certain extent. And again, there's no one way or the other. You have to figure out yourself what's the right level of doing that. Now, uh, what, how much time do I have left? Mm. 25 minutes. Um, yes. By the way, so this becomes almost my unit testing scope. Sometimes these things are also being unit tested. If something is really uh, supposed to be reusable and designed to be reusable, I test that separately. Same here. This one is also scope. And by the way, um, I don't know if you know that, but there's actually multiple level of tests. It's not like I only do one thing. So you've probably seen this thing, the, this triangle. You know, you have something called unit test here. Then you may have API testing. For example, in the .NET world, uh, it's very common to have an HTTP API here, and in your unit test, actually spin up the whole application, including the entire HTTP pipeline, because it runs all in memory, it's completely optimized, and actually send HTTP requests. And then, in the bottom, you can, for example, use um, a, a database, like a NoSQL database. They almost all have an in-memory representation. Is that still a unit test? Yeah, you can debate about that. I don't care too much about the term. I care about a suitable a level of testing. Uh, even if you use SQL Server, by the way, and we do that, we don't have all the tests, but some of the tests, you can actually run SQL Server in a Linux container, spin up the container before your test suite or a set of tests, run your test, and at the end, clean it up. It's really fast these days. These are things we couldn't do 20 years ago. So you have, I call them API tests, and maybe you have like end-to-end um, -end tests, and you have UI tests, you know, Cypress, I.O., or whatever tool you want to use. And on top of that, you have maybe manual testing. So it's not like I'm, I'm trying to preach that there's one way of doing it, but there never is. There never is. Any questions up to now? So why can't we take those small things we're starting to duplicate and create a new implement? So move it here, for example. Or are you saying like we extract this? The side block, this one. Oh, make it the fifth block. That everything depends on. Yes, that's perfectly OK. Because you know what happens with a code base? It evolves. It changes. It's not like, even though I might start with applying, uh, don't applying dry here, I might come to the conclusion, you know what? We now have four implementations, and I use the rule of three. I'm basically saying, like, twice is coincidence. Three times might be a pattern. You know, so it, it, that's what refactoring is about. You might actually say, I'm starting out here, but then I change my mind. Because, yeah, you do that. You have new insights and decide to extract that. You can even say, I'm extracting this and make it a shared service here. 
that you can directly depend on, that's perfectly fine. Or you come to the conclusion like, hey, I've actually identified that we have a new domain. And then I'm going to you know, have a fifth box, let's draw it here, a fifth box in the same way, I move this thing here, but that does mean, in my case, if I want to be puristic, that the fact that this box needs this little surface, it needs to make that very visible here at the bottom and then connect it together. That's perfectly fine. But that's what refactoring is about. And you could call it, well, is that refactoring? Is it maybe redesign? Yeah, sure. There's a, there's a gray line that you have to follow. But it's possible. It will evolve. I mean, if you're successful, your code base is running a production, it will change. Your product owner will welcome with new requirements. There will be new, new legal things that you have to comply to. Maybe you have scalability issues. Because what I like about this model is that potentially I can take, the, take this box and abstract it into, I, I'm afraid to, to use that word. You probably heard about it. It's very uh, convoluted and hyped. It's called a microservice. It's possible, but I'm not doing it by default. I actually like monoliths. I really get, um, I have to laugh very loudly that there's a lot of companies that have built a monolith, have it in production for a while, but they're struggling to deploy it automatically because they don't have a continuous deployment pipeline, because they start to introduce uh, bugs, or because they don't have this, these separations here, you know? And then the solution to all of that is because one of the guys in the team or girls or what do we call that, um, went to a conference and heard about microservices. And what do they do? And they think, you know what? We're going to move to microservices. So we're going to, you know, take this big chunk and then break it into, I don't know, 50 pieces. And then I have just duplicated my problem. I made it to put, like exponentially big. Uh, that doesn't work. Which brings me, by the way, I hope I answered your question kind of. Um, the, by the way, the point is also to make you think about this. I might be completely wrong. I hope not. Uh, because that would be a waste. Um, but it's perfectly okay to, to consider this and think about it and come to the conclusion that it doesn't work for you, but this worked for me, and I've been trying to do this for a long time. Which brings me to the topic of um, package-level dependencies, because we talked about architecture-level dependencies, and I have 20 minutes left. Package-level could also mean components. So whatever dependencies you have on the, on the, on the component level, uh, if you're building NPM packages, I don't know what it's called in Java, I always forget. Um, in .NET, it's NuGet. Um, and other, library, other platforms have different ways. The rules, if you want to have successful package management, is very simple. A package should do one thing only. Oh, really? Yeah? Surprise? No. What I'm trying to say is that typically I have a package, and the package consists of small building blocks. Um, which means that I do not like, for example, to have a consumer, let's draw a consumer, uh, like my son drew it. Drew it. Um, the consumer does not directly inherit, so there's no inheritance here. Inheritance, we don't want that, cross. We prefer composition over inheritance. So typically, package contains building blocks. Those building blocks have purpose by themselves, but they don't solve everything uh, in one go. You typically have to combine those building blocks. Many other libraries, what they do, they provide this super base class, which you inherit from, and then suddenly the world lights up. You have all kinds of capability. I don't like that myself because it creates coupling. And usually these are frameworks, and I don't know if you, the difference, you know the difference between frameworks and libraries. F libraries you use, frameworks use you. Yeah, that's a very old thing. I, I heard it from somebody. I didn't invent that. So I prefer small building blocks, and I still have higher level building blocks, but they're more convenient which makes it a little bit more easy to use. That means you have to understand the internal details of that, which I think is a good thing. I don't like frameworks because they hide magic, but as soon as you want to go beyond the magic, you have to understand how the magic works. And that's usually the problem. It's probably, in my case, I think it's better to actually take the hard route, you know, learn what happens under the hood so that you understand how the thing works. What's happening in this, everything in this package needs to change for the same reason. Yes, over. Um, which means that, let's say this package has a dependency, like there's an option to use this package with something else. Like, let's, um, in my own case, I have fluent assertions, which you don't know, but it doesn't matter, it's an assertion package, fluent assertions, which has lots of building blocks. Um, there's people that would like to use fluent assertions with, I don't know, Microsoft dependency injection or something like that. 
I don't want this one to take a dependency on that package. So what I do is, let's say I have Microsoft MSDI. What I do is I create another package in between. That package has a dependency on this one and a dependency on that one. Which makes sure that this one never has a dependency on that one. So if you don't want to use this, you never, if you, take, if you consume this package, you never have to deal with that one. And of course, if you're in the .NET space, you get this almost you know, thrown through your throat. Uh, but for different libraries, it's really important to do that. Like if you, have a, if you build your own ORM, and you have an implementation for Oracle, or for SQL, or whatever, Cosmos DB, then you would have something like that. The other rule, so there's no dependency here, dependency equals dependency inversion again. The other rule is that this package may only depend on other packages which are more stable or more abstract. Thank you. More abstract. If you follow this rule, if you always follow this rule, your component, your package, whatever you call it, can be, it can be a bunch of classes within your code base, uh, within this boundary. As long as you only take dependencies on things which are either more stable, so don't change that often or change less, or uh, are abstract, more abstract, you're usually fine. You can avoid the whole ripple effect. And that's very interesting. And this works. This is really mind-blowing if you start practicing this. It does result in lots of different smaller packages, which could be, uh, does have disadvantages, but I've experienced myself that it really made the situation better. There's one other. Sometimes this package contains additional things which can be useful, but are not always used. So let's say you have some test support here. This library can be used, and there's some test components to replace, like to have, uh, if you create your own unit test, and you want to use this component, and you want to have certain uh, uh, dummy implementations. If you have them, you need to ship them as separate packages. Uh, not this one, sorry. Other way around, like this. So, um, other stuff, I call it. Why? So, I often, uh, for packages, I often use semantic versioning. Everybody knows semantic versioning? Like the major number, the mi major means there's a breaking change, the minor means uh, there's new functional changes or bug fixes, and the third digit means there's only bug fixes. That's important. What I don't want, if I fix something in my test code, for example, in my test support class, that I have to ship an entire new release of that one. That's unnecessary. And that makes this possible. By having those sep completely separated, um, you can actually ship things independently, and you have a lot less coupling. Yes? Does it mean that you sometimes ending, that you also need to maintain several you know, sub-packages? Yes. It means that you sometimes have to create sub-packages of things that you have right now. Yeah. Um, for example, uh, somebody, like in this library, this is an assertion library for unit test, somebody thought it was useful to introduce data set support. Data sets is something that we don't use that much in .NET anymore. It's something from the, from the early days, like uh, 15 years ago. But we thought, like, you know, it's a nice contribution. The person spent a lot of time on it. Let's merge it. And now we're stuck. Because this library is evolving, uh, Microsoft is also building newer versions of .NET, which are fully cross-platform, trying to dump a lot of old stuff, and now we're stuck. So we actually accepted something that had a dependency on some, some specific Microsoft thing, which is now there. And it's very hard to say no. I, I have another talk about the whole the pains of open source development. And by the way, Matthias Koch, I don't know if you were in the session this morning, probably also talked about this. There's a lot of responsibility, but these responsibilities you also have if you maintain your own code base. You need to think about compatibility. You need to think about what should change at the same time. How do you create isolation in a code base? Because that's what um, uh, coupling and cohesion is about. You create cohesion that everything that you need to use together is in the same package, Everything that's not is in a separate package, and you avoid unnecessary coupling by doing this. So just follow up, silly question. You know, so if you have this, uh, you know, another package, let's say, why can't you just simply take this code to your package instead? If you have another package, why can't you simply take the code? Yeah, you know, just you extract something. Which yeah. Is Yeah.
Ah, but but that's there's no real except for managing dependencies and managing versions and being able to ship something without creating a new version, which is annoying and confusing, because somebody's using your package and they suddenly see a new version and it can be internally. Yeah? I'm a big proponent for inner sourcing, so basically adopting all these uh, open source way of working together also within the company. It's basically avoiding all these version bumps and making people confused, like oh there's a new package, you know your tool is telling you there's a new version and nothing changed like. What happened there? It creates a, avoids confusion. Also avoids shipping new versions, which you have to maintain. You know, that's what it is. And maybe at some point, uh, for example, there's a breaking change here in this external package that you depend on. You can probably solve that because this becomes the adapter. This solves the breaking change here, but it still depends on the old version of this one. And I've seen this many times. Okay, last section, if I remember correctly from my slide deck. And by the way, there was a new talk, so I'm surprised to remember stuff. What about legacy? Because I assume you all have to deal with existing code bases. I think you're very lucky if you can just start something new every week. Uh, I don't. I actually love um, existing code bases. How do you approach that? My general answer is I do a couple of things. The first thing I do is introducing characteristics characteristics tests. Character, I don't even know how to spell it. Characteristics. I cannot write without spell checker. Have you heard about it? Who has heard about characteristics tests? One person, kind of. Yeah. So there's a book written by Michael Fathers, and this book is called Dealing with, uh, 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 what is it called? Effective Strategies or something with Dealing with Legacy Code. He wrote only one book, Michael Fedders, look it up. He was also, by the way, at the conference in Hungary last week. Characteristics tests are extremely ugly, unmaintainable tests, which only purpose is to create a safety net around your existing code base. It literally encodes the current behavior that you get when you call a particular method with a particular database structure and make sure the assertion verifies the current outcome. And it's a kind of safety net. So let's say this is your, your legacy mess, legacy. What you're doing is creating a test suite, characterization tests, which basically calls this thing and tries to get as much coverage. And this is where coverage, automatic code coverage is actually valuable. It should give you an indication how complete the safety net is. And if you do that, then you have a temporary safety net. It doesn't matter that those tests are very difficult to maintain. All the normal rules that I myself follow, like your, code should, your test should be production code, are completely irrelevant here. They exist as a temporary safety net so that you can actually change things. Because uh, was anybody in the TDD talk this morning by uh, Tim? One of the things he said, like, test-driven development is a method to, make it, to give you confidence that you can refactor things without breaking things. This is kind of trying to set the first step. Then I'm going to scan this code base. I'm going to use uh, visualization tools. Like uh, I'm a big fan of JetBrains. Uh, I'm in a .NET space, so I use Rider a lot. I uh, haven't used Visual Studio for years. And it has built-in tools to create visual representations of the project structure. You can also look at class structures. And there's a lot of different tools that you can use for that purpose. It should give you an indication like what are the, where are the groups of things that are tightly coupled. Then I typically look at like, yeah, I'm not even going to write it out, but uh, I'm going to look at like, which classes are typically used together? Like, are they always used together? Are there, is there maybe one exception? Can I replace that one exception by duplicating that class? So I end up with a bunch of classes that together solve a problem. And then those pro classes, let's say there's this class and that class and that class, they become almost like a natural internal boundary. I'm basically identifying things which could be potentially seen as reusable components within your code base, which you then create small tests for. So you do basically not TDD, but you create tests. And then you make sure that the entry point is, for example, just an interface or something. I prefer role-based interface, so that everything that needs this depends on a new interface. And then maybe at some point, and that's what you said as well, you might create a new slice and you start to move code here. Because if everything, all the code in this box is depending on this abstraction, you can take this chunk and put it here. That's one step and, it, and you continue doing that. Um, what I also like to do is when I have a bit of a feeling of the code base, I understand the dependencies, I understand how things together and 
I use the uh, WTF word a couple of times because I see stuff that like, why would anybody actually create that? Um, if you're lucky, if, you're, if it's going well, you should get a sense of, okay, what would should this architecture really look like? You're creating maybe a, a slide uh, somewhere or you draw it out, like this is the envisioned architecture. And then you start to gradually, bit by bit, to move stuff to a new box. And this box is properly covered by tests. Maybe you can start test try, uh, applying TDD even. Maybe you can use dependency injection here, or use a, a, a dependency container. And do that step by step. I've done this many times. I've been doing this now for more than 26 years. I love code bases because there's so much to learn from the code base. I am very afraid of rebuilding. A lot of, a lot of clients I met, they said like, we just want to rebuild the thing. But I don't believe in that. There's usually so much knowledge, so much things in that code base that nobody remembers. Trying to rebuild it from scratch, I, I don't believe in that. I prefer to and basically create this little, little thing. And they, they have a nice name for that. Well, it's not a really nice name. It's called the Strangler pattern. So it's not really nice, actually. But you're essentially saying, I'm replacing this big chunk with nicely structured piece. And it can be like this. It can be layers. Hey, maybe you, you really want to have a layered architecture, but ideally, it should be as I said. Eh? You know, dependencies go upwards, ideally. And you gradually move in that direction. That's very easy for me to say it like that, you know, just draw a couple of boxes, move some code around, change some lines, so you're done. In reality, it's much more, much more painful, but it's so, it's very gratifying to see that code base evolve and, and being able to have nice structured code base. I, you can, ideally, I go to the repository and I see the names of this slice, you know, plus something called legacy. And I gradually also discover, because when you remove code here, some of these tests start to fail. If they fail for the right reason, it means you basically remove the code. That, that existing uh, characteristic test, you don't need it anymore because it has been replaced with nice, well-structured, well-scoped tests. And yeah, then at some point this is just gone. That's kind of the idea. I think, I probably skipped a couple of things, but it's great because you're going to get the slides afterwards. Tomorrow morning, I think at 9.20, I will also talk about the scope of testing and why it's not a class, which is kind of related to this topic, which I will dive a little bit deeper in that part. Um, I hope I didn't completely screw up my presentation uh, because I didn't have slides. I hope it was interesting. Um, I'll be around until tomorrow end of the day. Um, you know, hit me. Uh, no, well, not physically, but you know. <laughs> um, um, for questions, for challenges, because yeah. I love to talk about this stuff, that's probably obvious, and um, I think I'm successful with this, but it's not obvious, it's not trivial to do this kind of stuff. But that's why you're senior developers, architects, stuff like that, and you get paid the big bucks, right? <laughs> All right, if there's any questions left. Everybody is like, oh, completely, yes. Wait, 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 wait. So, microphone, if you don't mind. Uh, how to decide whether we should uh, repeat this, the part of the code or put it in the shared ah. service? So how do you decide when you should duplicate the code or when it should be um, deduplicated and become some kind of shared service? It depends. <laughs> now, it's, it's the, you know, the thing is, the, the, the things which tend to be simple I would probably duplicate. Uh, it's again a very stupid answer, actually, and I think of it. And the things that are complicated, no. So some of the things we have in this lower layer <clears throat> is, for example, a component that handles um, uh, cluster-wide um, logs. Like I have certain operations, like initializing the database, um, where I want to make sure that if I have an entire cluster of machines, only one of the machines can do that. That is pretty complicated. You probably need to have a database log, you need to handle uh, when, the, uh, when the application crashes, that the other process can pick it up. There's a lot of orchestration. That is something I don't want to be duplicated. So I would probably, probably it starts here, and at some point I extract that into a separate package. Why? Because this is not something that changes a lot. You create it once, you make it rock solid, which will take a while, you'll find bugs and everything, but after that it's done. It doesn't need any more functionality. So, and you know, related to the package thing, I would probably then extract that, make that a separate package, and since that package is very stable, doesn't change a lot, it's perfectly fine to take a dependency. 
but yeah, in general, it's very hard. You'll probably have a feeling like, okay, but this is not really rocket science. There's no need to duplicate that. I, the thing is, I tend to be more conservative. So I tend to take the duplication side, whereas in the past, um, I would actually go for you know creating services and creating this generic layer and everything. Be but because I've seen so many code bases where it hurt, I, I try not to do that. I don't know if there's a real answer, but hopefully the next time you try to say, okay, I'm going to create a new surface, like, oh, what did this guy from the Netherlands say, you know, with the, with the, with the ugly writing style? Hopefully you remember that. Thank you. Yes? Out of time, I think. Oh, maybe two minutes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>